Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second of our library lunchtime lectures for this semester. And I think we have a multimedia extravaganza in the offing from Robin Turner here. You shall have found the pieces of paper uh, on your chairs, and you will have noticed that the chairs themselves are arranged into four blocks. Uh, Robin will be explaining that shortly. Um, the subject for today is what educators can learn from games. And when Robin first proposed the talk, and I misread gamification, I thought it was gamification. I thought gamma rays or something, that's not what he works on. But it, uh, gamification, I, I assume, is the correct pronunciation. Let me tell you a little bit about Robin Turner, and then I shall be quiet and let him take over, because I think there is a lot to happen. Uh, Robin Turner uh, is a countryman of mine. He a fellow countryman from the United Kingdom. He is from uh, not too far away from I come from as well. And to uh, paraphrase the poet uh, E.A. Houseman, he is a Shropshire lad, uh, I think. Um, he took his uh, degree, his BA degree in English and music from the University of Leeds in 1982 with a bit of Chinese thrown in. Don't read that, that's my thing. Um, and later on in the late 1990s, he, he did his master's degree in linguistics from the University of Surrey. In the meantime, uh, getting a certificate for teaching English as a foreign language. He moved to Turkey in the early 90s, I think, and joined Bill Kent in 1993, originally working in the uh, preparatory program, but for the most of the time being an instructor in the Faculty of Academic English program, which is a very important part of what Bill Kent does to support the uh, English skills in an academic and uh, scholarly sense for our students. In addition to his English teaching, uh, Robin is also a member of uh, the, now it was BETS, the Bill Kent Educational Technology Support Team, a few other of his colleagues at the back here today, and they do great work in providing, obviously, technological support for uh, courses for teachers, especially through uh, coordinating Moodle, which uh, many of us use uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, his research interests include popular culture, cognitive linguistics, and obviously for today, education. Um, we will have, I hope, time for questions at the end. We shall finish as close to 1.30 uh, as possible. And I would require you all, just so we don't disturb the recording, if you can switch your telephones off or to silent mode, and then uh, we will have a good uh, YouTube recording, and you can watch this at your leisure uh, again and again. Okay, I will finish there. Pass the microphone to Robin. Okay, um, David mentioned the slightly unusual seating arrangement. Um, this is because, since this is a talk about games, I thought I'd start with a game, which will hopefully illustrate some of the principles I'm going to talk about. So the blocks here are your teams. Uh, you are Gryffindor. You are Hufflepuff. Ravenclaw. And somewhat outnumbering the rest, uh, Slytherin, always the ones with the unfair advantage. Uh, you may also have noticed, if you're sitting at the front, um, that there is a musical instrument. Um, so this is the, the noisemaker. Um, one and only one person may be the keeper of the noisemaker. So, Gusha, why don't you have the one for your team? Um, the way this works, very simple quiz game. Uh, I will ask a question. If you think you know the answer, get your keeper of the noisemaker to make a noise. Um, answers called out a turn will not be counted. Uh, if you get it right, you get two points. If you get it wrong, you get one point, and it goes to the next team. So for example, if Gryffindor get it wrong, it goes to Hufflepuff for a bonus point, one bonus point. Uh, or if Slytherin gets, gets it wrong, it goes to Gryffindor like this. OK. So. The first question is, in which year, oh, by the way, if anybody was at my conference presentation last summer, you're not allowed to answer, because uh, these are the same questions. Uh, in which year was the word gamification first used? Make a noise. Yes, Slytherin. 65. 
Uh, no, Slytherin are now on minus one. So it goes to Gryffindor automatically. Gryffindor for a bonus point. 95 is also wrong, but there are no, there are no penalties for a bonus, so it goes to Hufflepuff. 2005, yes. This is the only one left. So Hufflepuff get a bonus point. Next question. Oh, by the way, um, for those of you who are interested in language change, this is from Google. It shows when uh, it started getting common. So 2005, 2006 is the earliest anybody's seen it. But you can see it's completely exploded in the last two years. Yeah? It's one of these buzzwords. There are a few others, um, game-based learning, serious games. The differences between them are kind of slight. Uh, gamification is such a new word that nobody really agrees on the definition, but the most common one is the use of game mechanics to enhance non-game activities. Uh, Game-based learning speaks for itself, so using games in education. Serious games is another new term. Uh, it sounds like a contradiction, but it means any game that has a serious purpose. Uh, serious games are often used in political activism, for example. So, your next question. This is a tricky one. Anybody know who this woman is? Wow, uh, that was Ravenclaw, I think. She was, she was from the TED Talk. That's close, but what is her name? Uh, her name was Jane McGonagall. Jane McGonagall, well done. Two points for Ravenclaw. Uh, yeah, so she's... She never actually uses the term gamification herself. She's more from the serious games movement. But she's very, very influential. She's a kind of like game goddess. And in particular, she wrote a book called Reality is Broken. And there she claims that the reason why there is this massive exodus into games, and particularly online games, is not because games are evil things that are rotting our brains, but actually games get a lot of things right that the real world gets wrong. Some of those things that games get right we'll be talking about later. Okay. Next question. Easy one. What is this game? Uh, again, Ravenclaw. Well, first, I think. World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft. Okay. <laughs> the reason why World of Warcraft is important and it crops up so much in the literature on game studies, it's a phenomenally successful game. Millions of people play it. Uh, according to Jane McGonagall, a typical World of Warcraft player, not an addict, a typical player spends around 20 hours a week playing World of Warcraft. Yeah? Um, this is one reason why I don't pay it, because I'd lose my job if I spent that much time playing online games. Um, so because of this, people have been really studying World of Warcraft. And what is it about this game that makes people play it so much? And again, gamification experts in particular are trying to work out, well, maybe we can get some of the features of this game that make it so addictive and apply it to something we want people to do, like learn something, buy our product, or whatever. Next question, what is the world's second largest wiki? The largest wiki, of course, is Wikipedia. Uh, the second largest, anybody, I think... Gryffindor were first this time. No, that was the first. <laughs> Listen to the question carefully. Uh, so that goes to Hufflepuff for a bonus. One point if you can get the, wor the world's second largest wiki. <laughs> no, going round. Ravenclaw is indeed correct. Ravenclaw are streaming away here. Yeah. Um, I took this screenshot uh, last summer, so it, now it will be over 100,000 pages. This is phenomenal. So not only are these people spending 20 hours a week playing a game, on top of that, they're spending time to help other people play the game. Yeah, they're writing pages, game tips, walkthroughs, most of all, pages about Azeroth, the imaginary world of World of Warcraft. 
Uh, this is not a phenomenon, of course, that's restricted to games. Hobbies of any kind have the same effect. When I was doing a course on fantasy literature uh, a few years ago, I had a couple of guys in my class who I used as my Tolkien consultants because they knew everything, not just about the Lord of the Rings, but even the Silmarillion. They had read the Silmarillion in English. That, it's a book that thick, and it's not fun. It's really, really dense. It's not a novel about hobbits. It's Tolkien's history and mythology. Uh, so that got me thinking, well, how can I leverage this kind of enthusiasm and actually get students to apply it to stuff they're supposed to be learning? Unfortunately, it's not very easy. Okay. Next question. How do you pronounce these three names? Gryffindor. Uh, or all three of these. <laughs> uh, that, well, if you're passing, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to Slytherin. Okay, Slytherin. Yes, try. Uh-huh. Uh, I'll give you one point, so at least you're, you're not in negative things. Okay. Um, the first one had me completely stumped. I had to ask my, my colleague Marinus, who is Dutch. Um, apparently, it is something like Johan Hezicha. Okay. He's important because he wrote a book called Homo Ludens, Man the Player, which is the classic of game studies. Okay. What he did was look at a lot of things which aren't games, or that we don't think of as games, but show how they have a play element. So he looks at the play element in religion, the play element in art, the play element in war, even. Uh, and of course, this prefigures gamification by about 50 years. Uh, Roger Calois, that was the one you got right, um, he was a French sociologist who took up Hezinka's work. Um, we'll be looking later at his, at his classification of games. And this last person, which even I have problems with, uh, in my class I usually just say that guy, um, Mihai Csent Mihai, I am told is the correct pronunciation. Um, it's a Hungarian name, uh, although he lives in America. He's a psychologist, and he's important for a concept called flow. Um, he wrote a book called Flow, the Psychology of Optimal Experience, if I remember rightly. It's in your handout. Flow is a state of intense absorption in an activity. It's when you're completely concentrated on an enjoyable activity to the extent that you blot out the outside world. You lose your self-consciousness. You may even experience distortion of time. So thing, time seems to go a lot quicker than it normally does. Or occasionally the reverse happens and everything's in slow motion. At an extreme up here, it gets to be a kind of like zen-like trance. Most games are around about here, so still in the very pleasurable activity. And what this comes from, according to Chisent Mahai, is a balance of challenge and skills. So if you have high challenge and not enough skills for it, this produces anxiety. This is what you feel when you're in an exam, for example. Um, if the challenge level isn't high enough for your skill level, you can end up with <coughs> boredom. Uh, if both of them are low, so the task is very easy, but you're not particularly good at it, then you just get apathy. So basically, what games try to do is deliberately move people up here by matching challenge level to skill level. The, the clearest way you have that is in computer games where you actually do have levels and you level up uh, as the challenges get progressively more difficult. But also a game like tennis. Okay? Tennis players try to match themselves with other players of the same skill level so that they are always playing at the peak of their skill. If I was playing Venus Williams, um, she would be um, maybe relaxed or bored. I would be probably fed up. Yeah. Um, so, again, this is something that we can apply to education, I think. Whoops. OK, 
Okay, last question, easy one. What film is this? Uh, Slytherin were slightly first. The Hunger Games, indeed. This is our, our heroine, Katniss. Um, I put this in just to show that not... <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so they're in the finally into positive points. Uh, I put this in to show that um, not all games are good. Games can be completely unethical or brutal. Um, and hence, not all gamification is a good thing. Some of it works very well. Some of it... Um, fails completely. Some of it works, but in a kind of nasty, manipulative way. So, time permitting, I'll be looking at the dark side of gamification later. Okay, so our winner is Ravenclaw. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so what we can see in this little activity then is some of the features that um, games have. And I'll be looking at these in more detail now, but first we need to actually say what a game is, and this is not easy. Wittgenstein famously argued that games were indefinable. There are no characteristics that you can say all games have which distinguishes them from non-games. And in absolute terms, I think he's right. All of the definitions that I've read of games are either so broad they include some things that aren't games, uh, Bernard Suits is an example of that. He described a game as the voluntary acceptance of unnecessary obstacles. Um, it's a pretty good definition, actually, but it does include some things that I wouldn't count as, as games. Um, others are too narrow, um, so they only include, for example, competitive games. Um, I've come up with my own definition. Um, this still doesn't work for all things that are called games. It doesn't work for what I call peripheral games. Things like gladiatorial games, the Hunger Games, or the games of game theory. Um, but it does work for most everyday things that we call games. Anything from World of Warcraft to chess to football. So my definition is a game is a structured activity designed to facilitate play. This is kind of passing the buck, really, because... I haven't defined play. Um, fortunately, we don't need a precise definition of play because I think we all have an intuitive sense of what play is. We know when we are playing. We can also tell when other people are playing or even animals. As you can see, very obviously playing. Okay, so... Oh, well, we, we can look at a few characteristics of play. Um, the first, and I think the most important, is that play is something that is done for its own sake. If you are doing something in order to get some result at the end, and that's your main focus, then you're not playing. You're probably working. Um, this doesn't, however, mean that play has to be completely useless. Here, I disagree with uh, Roger Calois. He describes play as a glorious waste, a waste of time, a waste of energy, often a waste of money. But I do think that games can have a useful purpose, hence the serious games we mentioned before. The important thing, though, is that you mustn't be thinking about the purpose when you're playing the game. You can start playing tennis in order to lose weight. But if you're playing tennis and you're always thinking, oh, I'm burning some more calories now, this is really good for me, um, then you're not really playing. You're doing tennis, perhaps, but you're not playing tennis. And this is a big problem for gamification. How do you set up a game or a game-like activity designed for a practical purpose without making people focus on the purpose rather than on the game? Another thing is that games create their own meaning. Um, the guy we talked about first uh, with the guttural name, he Hezinha um, talked about a thing called, he, he called the magic circle. The magic circle is what kind of draws a boundary between the game and the world outside the game. So it can be a physical space like a football field. It can be a temporal boundary. So the time that the game starts and the game finishes. But within the magic circle, 
things have a different meaning. The clearest example is boxing. Um, if I were to go over and punch a member of the audience in the face, um, I would lose my job. I might go to prison. I do the same thing in a boxing ring. I score a point. Yeah. Things mean different things in the game and outside the game. And because of this, games are never meaningless within the game. The game itself can be completely meaningless. You could even say the game is by definition not meaningless. But within the game, everything has a meaning. You never hear fanatical game players complaining about apathy or ennui or having an existential crisis. Nobody goes into World of Warcraft and says, oh my god, why do we have to kill all these orcs? <laughs> yeah? The meaning generates itself. And the last thing is that games are actively absorbing. <laughs> Many activities can be absorbing. Watching TV, reading a book, and so on. Um, but their activity is limited. Yeah? You can react to a book, but you cannot interact with a book. I know educators sometimes talk about making students interact with the text. This is complete nonsense. Unless it's some very weird kind of hypertext where w the way you read it changes the actual novel. Um, even, the, even if you're thinking really hard about a book, you're not actually doing anything to the book. Games, on the other hand, and play in general, you are actually doing the main action. The most important thing is what you do, not what, is, not what you're watching, not what is done to you. Okay. So how do games achieve this? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, before, before talking about how games achieve this, I'd just like to say the way we normally think about work and play, um, we think of it either as a, a black and white thing or as a kind of spectrum going from work to play. Um, I disagree. I think it's actually more like this. So if play is an activity done entirely for its own sake and drudgery, for lack of a better word, is an activity that is only done for some external reward, not at all uh, worthy or enjoyable in itself, then work can be anywhere here. Yeah? Unfortunately, for most people, it's closer to this. Um, for us academics, we're lucky. It's kind of closer to here. But then, not all the things that we do. I mean, like, putting the attendance on stars comes around about here. Um, Okay, so ways that games facilitate play. One, uh, Calois calls this agon, which is a Greek word. Um, uh, the word antagonist, for example, comes from this. Agon games are basically games of competition. Yeah. Um, I love this picture. I mean, this is from, taken from a chess tournament. Uh, and as if chess wasn't enough, they are also arm wrestling in the breaks between chess matches. The important thing about Agon, though, is that it's not real competition. If the competition is real, then it's just competition. It's not a game. Yeah, it's a war. It's a business competition. Um, it's an exam, whatever. Alia is the Latin word for dice. So Calua uses this to describe any game that is based primarily on chance. Uh, I would say if it was pure chance, then it kind of gets away from being a game. I don't think... Betting on horses is a game. Uh, I don't think buying a lottery ticket is a game. But roulette is interesting because although the game is entirely based on chance, uh, you have what Chisent Mihai calls the paradox of control. The players actually think they are playing. What they do, as far as I know, actually has no real effect uh, on whether they're well. It only affects how much they're going to lose. Um, but they come up with these amazing formulas and strategies. Mimicry is role-playing, very popular in modern online games. But also, as we can see, this is a medieval fair with people dressing up as medieval characters. Also, children playing cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians. That is also mimicry. Yeah. Uh, Ilinx, uh, Calois uses this to describe games which involve some kind of vertigo or disorientation. Uh, I'm not going to look at that because it's not the kind of thing we want really happening in the classroom. Uh, there's one other, though, uh, that Kanwa does not mention. Uh, I invented this one. Um, thanks to my colleague uh, Bill from the philosophy department uh, who came up with the Greek. In addition to its modern name of a mystery, Enigma was also the ancient Greek 
word for a riddle or a puzzle. And I think puzzle solving or st strategic choice is a very important feature of games. Um, this is an example of gamification or serious games. Uh, it's a game called a Turner. And what you do is you actually try and pull these things into shapes that work, and you end up with RNA. And if they really like the RNA you come, with, come up with, apparently uh, genetic engineers will make it for you. Uh, so basically, they're using games as a way of doing research in biology. Okay. So how do we actually apply this in education? I think there are three ways you can kind of gamify your curriculum. The first is to insert an existing game, like an off-the-shelf game, into your curriculum. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this much because uh, most of the good work that's been done here is, is with primary education. Because there are a lot of commercially available games that work very well for teaching uh, young children basic skills, basic information. But they wouldn't work so well for us at a university level. Uh, an example would be games like Civilization or Age of Empires. They're great for getting young children interested in history. Um, if David were to use one of these in his history class, then he would have to spend all his time explaining the historical inaccuracies in the game. Um, so the second one, gamifying a class activity. Uh, so you take something you were going to do anyway and turn it into a game. And the last one is, without doing anything that is recognizably a game, borrow some of the features of the game to make things more motivating. So to look at some examples, uh, this is the only case I have here of an off-the-shelf game. Um, we're all familiar with Hangman, especially us English teachers. Um, I found uh, an open source online version of Hangman and put it on our FA unit website. Uh, but I hacked it so that the words that it came up were all words from the academic word list. This is a list of words that are common in uh, academic journal articles. Uh, and so it, it's just there as an extra activity for students to practice. Looking at the second thing, uh, gamifying an activity. Uh, English teachers do a lot of this. Uh, gap fill exercises. We love them. Uh, unfortunately, students don't always love them because by the time they get into Bill Kent, they've done you know, several thousand of these. Uh, so when I was looking at a text, um, that it happened to have a lot of good vocabulary about research that I wanted to students to practice. My first reaction as an English teacher, oh, fill in the gaps. And then I thought, well, that's kind of boring. So what I did was turn it into a game. Uh, firstly, by making it competitive, the algon element, just like I did with these four teams here. I put students into the same teams, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, and so on, at the beginning of the semester. So any time I want to do group work, they are there in their teams. Uh, so I gave this to each of the teams, and they competed with each other to come up with the right answers. OK, still not very exciting, still not much of a game. It's just a competitive activity. Um, what I then did was tie it in with a point system. Points are very important in games because they give you immediate feedback on how well you are doing. It could be scoring a goal in football or a point in tennis or getting experience points in an online role-playing game. It doesn't matter. Um, points always make people go, oh, I've got some points. We saw this at the beginning. These points don't mean anything here. I mean, nobody, after this talk is finished, uh, nobody is going to come up to the people here and say, oh, Ravenclaw, you did so well. No, but at the time, you think, oh, wow, I'm getting points. So I gave them uh, six points if it was the correct word and it was also in the text. Um, three points for a, a word that kind of fit. Um, they also lost points if it was misspelt or if they spoke Turkish at any point. Um, so again, it's now becoming more game-like. And as a last feature, I use one of my favorite pieces of educational technology. I gave them each team a set of cards in one suit from 1 to 10. So if they gave up the cards, so for example, they gave me the 10, they got a clue for question 10. 
Yeah, I gave them the first letter of the word in the blank. Yeah. At the end, they got a point for each of the cards remaining. So they had to make a strategic choice. Is it worth surrendering a point for the chance of getting six points? So that shows us how you can employ all these different game mechanics to gamify um, a very standard activity. It also demonstrates, though, that it's not actually easy. Um, it's taken me about a year to get this game right. I'm still tweaking it. Because you have to get the scoring system right uh, and the clues right so that people will actually play it as a game. There are times I've done it when I've got the balance wrong and people did not give up any of their cards, either because the questions were so easy that they could get them anyway, or, uh, as happened this morning, um, they found the questions so difficult, they thought, well, at least we'll hang on to our cards, so we know we're not going to get less than 10 points. Um, so this is why uh, game mechanics are worth studying quite seriously and experimenting with. This next one is a game I played with an interactive whiteboard. Okay, so on to round two. Yeah, it's, it's, it feels kind of weird, like, being here and here. It was provided by people doing research on interactive whiteboard use, by the way. <laughs> Okay, um, this illustrates a couple of things. Um, one is that although I have my doubts about interactive whiteboards as a pedagogical tool, I actually find them quite frustrating to use. They're great toys. Uh, and so just having like, you know, the magic Harry Potter wand here um, actually makes people more playful, just like the presence of the cards did in the previous game. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that uh, I was explaining the grammar while... I was playing the game. So the first student put in a semicolon before but. Um, and then the second student got a comma. So the question was, why is a semicolon not as good as a comma? Uh, so one of them said, oh, it's Turkish. That's why I said, oh, yeah, it's Turkish punctuation. Uh, as far as I understand Turkish, they tend to use a semicolon rather like a big comma. Certainly a lot of places in English where you'd use a comma, you use a semicolon. Um, I'll skip over that. Um, so those, those are examples of making a game out of an ordinary activity. But as I said, you can also just take a feature of games and try and apply it to completely non-game activities. So we've seen competition is really important for games. Um, however, the education system is already competitive enough in itself. So what you don't want to do is make a competitive situation more competitive. The competition in a game has to be only for the sake of playing the game. Uh, again, something that Bernard Suits said when he was trying to define games is that game rules impose inefficient means which are only accepted for the sake of the activity they make possible. 
Or in other words, you accept the conditions of the game, the rules of the game, only in order to play the game. So the competition in a game must only be for that game. In other words, if I played a game like this in class, those points do not translate into real grades. As soon as you do that, the students stop playing and they start working. Um, the other thing is that collaboration in games is actually at least as important as competition. If you look at the most popular games, the ones that attract the most attention, they're mainly team games. Yeah? Football, basketball. These are the games that people enjoy playing and also enjoy watching a lot. They inspire loyalty. Similarly, in computer games, uh, about 20 years ago, a computer game was something you sat on your own and you just played against the computer. Now, the most popular games are online games where you collaborate with other players. Yeah? And sometimes this collaboration can be very, very um, intense. Um, in World of Warcraft, for example, you can get a group of 40 people collaborating on a major mission. They spend hours planning it beforehand, before they actually do it. They, they then spend hours doing it, and then they'll probably spend hours talking about it afterwards. We seem to be hardwired for this mixture of collaboration and cooperation. We like helping people. Even more, we like helping people beat other people. Yeah? So if you can get both of these together, it's very good. Um, as I said, it doesn't have to be in an activity that's obviously a game. Um, as I said, I have these students in their, their groups, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, and so on, all the way through. So anytime I want to do a group activity, I can just say, oh, get in your teams. And they will, they will work together because they're used to working together. I also sometimes introduce a little bit of um, competition surreptitiously. So one thing I often do is get students to do a task uh, which will result in writing something or drawing a diagram or a picture. And I say, OK, you have 20 minutes to do this. At the end of that time, we'll put them on the whiteboard, and we'll see which one is the best. I just kind of like sneak that in so that not only are they trying to produce something themselves, because they have to, they're producing something because they want it to be better than the other groups, or at least not embarrassingly bad. Games have clear, inspiring goals. You always know why you're doing a game. The goal, the goal in chess is to checkmate the opponent's king. The goal in basketball is to put the ball through the hoop more times than the opposing team does. This relates back also to games creating their own meaning. Um, I've noticed something in my own teaching that I'm quite bad at, um, is that if I don't remind myself I don't actually tell students what the goals are. Yeah? I say, well, you know, do this, but I don't tell them what they're doing it in order to achieve. So something I am trying to work on in my personal pedagogy um, is actually making it very clear why students are doing an activity. If it's a game, obviously I'm clear about the rules of the game, but also, like, why are we playing this game? What is the point of this uh, challenges, we've seen before. The whole flow thing, it's all about getting the challenge level right. We have a problem as educators because the level is set for us. It's not like a computer game where you move up levels um, as you get better. All students in our courses have to end up with a certain minimum standard of knowledge or skills. However, within a course, I think it's worth having tasks of different challenge levels. I wouldn't, for example, want to teach a course which was based only on writing three essays. Because writing an essay is a very challenging activity. All the students here know this. So although I have to make my students write essays, I prefer to break it up. So there are some little tasks as well as big tasks. You also see this in good online games. Again, in a game like World of Warcraft, you have your big opponents. They're called bosses in games. So the one at the end of the level who is almost impossible to kill. But you don't do that all the time. You also go out and just like kill some wild boar or a few orcs, relax with it, an easier challenge. Another thing which, again, is hard to apply 
um, but good games do. Good games have multiple routes to achieving the goal. For example, chess has one goal, mate to the opponent's king. But it has an infinite number of ways of achieving that goal. So applying that to education, it's worth giving students as much freedom as possible in terms of how they do a task. Build as much choice as you can into that. So for example, if you're going to set an essay question, set three questions. Let the students choose which one they want to do. Uh, similarly, I recently had my students do a research proposal. I gave them a choice between doing an outline and writing an abstract. They both achieved the same thing. They both said what is going to be in their research paper, but there were different ways of doing it. Feedback we've mentioned. Uh, the problem that we have as educators is that we are not computer games. We cannot give out points automatically when you kill an orc or blow up a spaceship. Um, we have to take time to grade students' work. Um, the only advice I can give here, uh, apart from, like, from time to time, really do bust a gut and get those essays graded over the weekend, um, break things up as much as possible. Like I said, have little tasks as well as big tasks. Uh, and also, have feedback that isn't part of the grade. Um, one thing I do a lot on Moodle is I, pu I put out quizzes, uh, usually vocabulary quizzes, and students can do them if they want. The grade they get on the quiz doesn't matter. It's just feedback. It only tells them how well they've done. Relating with feedback, you get a sense of accomplishment when you, you do something. Those two go together. Um, and then particularly when we give feedback, we need to make it very, very clear when a student has achieved a goal. Um, a sense of surprise, a bit hard, harder. But uh, again, as we'll see in a second, in my Moodle page, I try, and, I try to have some random ele elements. That's like Calois' idea of alia. And finally, uh, investment in loss. This is um, a phrase, it, ac it actually comes from Tai Chi. Um, Zheng Mang Qing, who was my Tai Chi's teacher's, teacher's teacher, um, when he was a young man in China, he spent a lot of his time going around challenging different martial artists and getting beaten up um, deliberately. He would challenge the best people so he would learn how they beat him. Uh, so by the time that he moved to Taiwan, uh, he was pretty much invincible because he knew all the different ways to beat somebody because they'd all been done on him. How does this apply to games? Um, again, Jay McGonagall noted that um, four times out of every five, players in World of Warcraft are losing. Yeah. On average, anything you, you do, you have to fail at it four times before you can achieve it. Yeah. Um, we do not allow to this in our education system. I wish we did. Um, students need the opportunity to fail without failing disastrously, without it being an epic fail. At the moment, we have epic fails. You fail the course. You repeat the year. We don't want that. We want little bits of failure. Um, ways we might be able to do this, um, for example, a portfolio system. Um, if you, let's say you do four lab reports, you pick the three that you want to submit, or four essays for anything. Um, so students should be allowed to mess up once or twice in the semester, because that's how they learn. Okay. I mentioned the dark side of gamification. Ah, wait. Um, sorry, before, before I mention the dark side of gamification, uh, just a few things about this. Yeah? OK. Um, Progress bar, sense of accomplishment. Um, points here. Um, and the vocabulary quiz that I mentioned. Also a random glossary entry for the randomness aspect. OK, um, I was going to mention the dark side of gamification, but we've run out of time. OK, a minute. OK, I will just say one thing. The danger of gamification is that it can become mechanical. It can become manipulative. The worst thing that could happen 
with gamification would be for educational managers to take the idea and run with it and say, okay, gamification is a wonderful thing. All your classes must have games. All your Moodle sites must have uh, scoreboards. And you must do this, you must do that. Um, uh, another uh, game theorist, uh, Kass, uh, put it very nicely. He who must play cannot play. If you force people to play, then they are not playing. Okay. So just to sum up, we've seen a game is a structured activity designed to facilitate play. A curriculum is a structured activity designed to facilitate learning. I think the key is to introduce the play into the curriculum. So a curriculum becomes a playful activity designed to facilitate learning. Okay, thank you. I'm going to disagree. These points are very important. I was in Gryffindor and we lost. <laughs> so I'm going to take that away for the... No, no. Okay, thank you, Robin, for what was an extremely interesting talk. We're more or less out of time, but if you need to leave for a class, please go. If anyone has any questions, we can maybe take one quick question, or you can talk to Robin. Looks like everyone's got... Okay, many students here, they've got a class. If you have a question, come and see Robin. I'm here. Uh, okay, thanks again, Robin. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey. Where do you get the software for your games on Moodle? Um, 